The purpose of Wealth Talk is to educate, inform, and hopefully entertain you on the subject of building your wealth. Wealth Builders recommends you should always take independent financial, tax, or legal advice before making any decisions around your finances. Today's episode is brought to you by Wealth Builders Membership, a proven step by step process that helps you achieve financial security within two to three years. To find out more, head to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash membership. Welcome to this week's episode of Wealth Talk. My name's Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good to be with you again. So today we are focusing on the business pillar, pillar five of our seven pillars of wealth. And uh, we've got Mr. Jeremy Harbour as our guest, and uh, he's going to be talking to us about how you can buy businesses without using cash up front. Businesses with no money down, Chris. Surely that's a lesson we all want to learn. Yeah, well, we hear that... Uh, in property, don't we? We know there's many different property strategies. And today, Jeremy's going to be talking about not necessarily starting a business, which perhaps is what people think about with the business pillar, but the opportunity of, of getting into businesses where you can add some value and then you can negotiate terms of sale. And um, yeah, well, we'll hear from Jeremy how he goes about that himself. Mm. Are we going to talk about the pros and cons of doing uh, building capital events from businesses and property and so on or we do that in the debrief or you want to start on that and get right into it i think you know jeremy's got some some really good experience over 20 years and well we know he will be mentioning capital events and uh, at wealth builders we focus a, a lot on recurring income but of course you've got capital and you've got recurring income and i think a blend of both is important when you're building wealth well unquestionably the case if you even if you were to go into the general drab conversations just about building retirement income. Um, any decent IFA is going to have a chat with you about what your income needs are, but also what your capital needs are. Moving house, buying cars, holidays, all those things. So in our life, we need to be planning for cash flow, spendable money, capital, so that we can not just reinvest, but also we can help build our, our net worth so that our Balance sheet is on the rise and also our cash flow statement is on the rise. So both are important, but of course we give much greater importance as people begin their wealth journey into capturing uh, income coming from assets to get to income security. And I know Jeremy has an interesting piece of language to explain that, which is our language, but just done in a, a fancier way. Absolutely. So keep your ears open for that one. And uh, yeah, let's uh, head on over now to our conversation today with Mr. Jeremy Harbour. Hey, I'm joined today by Jeremy Harbour, investor, business consultant, global leader in the field of small business mergers and acquisitions. And Jeremy, you've bought and sold over 100 companies and advised on over 200 acquisitions. Welcome to Wealth Talk today. Hi, thank you for having me. Tell me first, what's motivating you? Why do you do this? I was a startup entrepreneur. I started loads of businesses when I was a, when I was a kid. I had a business in the 1990s that was in telecoms. Telecoms expanded hugely when uh, there was deregulation plus miniaturization of mobile phones. That industry became acquisitive, and I suddenly got turned on to the idea of growth through acquisition or growth by doing deals. And once you do your first one, uh, there's no turning back. It's like you've opened, uh, uh, pulled the curtain back on a whole new world that you never knew existed. So, um, yeah, it was uh, an absolute game changer. So, you know, it's been a good 20 plus years uh, or so. I imagine that you've been in this, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions. In that time, you've written three books as well. Most recently, Go Do Deals, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Buying and Selling Businesses. And you've moved around the world. So currently in Dubai, what, what, what took you there? Yeah, it's COVID refugee, basically. So we were very happily settled down. Uh, I have a, a wife and two kids. Um, we were very happily settled down in Singapore. We lived there for 12 years. We were Singapore permanent residents, which is one level before citizenship. In fact, we would qualify for citizenship in the, in the country. And they just got a little bit uppity over the flu um, and made the city you know, pretty much unlivable. So we traveled during COVID year, um, during 2020. I was lucky, lucky enough to have my own aeroplane. So we were free to go anywhere we wanted. When you land in your own plane, you're a high value business traveler, which was one of the excluded, the uh, allowed to travel categories, which is basically 
you know, rich people were allowed to travel. Everybody else had to stay at home, obviously, <laughs> which is incredibly unfair. But that's why your listeners need to become the rich people that can do what they like. Um, and yeah, we literally just COVID dodged. So we just flew around different countries as they opened up throughout uh, 2020. And we ended up November 2020 in Dubai. The rest of the world was kind of closing down in that second wave that was happening at the time. And so we bought a house, put the kids in school, bought a couple of cars, and then it became very hard to leave after that. So it was quite impulsive. Um, but uh, after living in Singapore, everything in Dubai is 90% cheaper. So buying a house is more like kind of finding some change down the back of the sofa instead of a life-changing decision that you have to make with your wife. So it was a very much a different kind of uh, uh, approach here. As you're aware, Jeremy, at Wealth Builders, we teach a holistic process to our members, uh, all centered around seven pillars of wealth. Now, pillar five is business. Why do you like the business asset so much? Well, so bi businesses for me are a great way of a creating an income stream, but actually more importantly, it's a way of creating a capital event. So in my kind of Harbour Club community, we talk about wealth a lot. And one of the definitions I use is what I call escape velocity investing. Now, escape velocity is a, a rocket science term, you know, the amount of energy required to escape the Earth's gravitational pull and get into um, space. The gravitational pull I'm describing is your expenses. So your house, your travels, your cars, your, you know, all of these things that, you know, you have to spend every month. Um, and, uh, you know, those kind of fixed costs that build up over, uh, over time as you get older, the things that were luxuries become essentials. This creates the gravitational pull on your, on your wealth. And so what we try and do is create an income stream that pays for all of that. And so that your investing can then be exponential. So instead of choosing to invest 10 or 15% of your income, you can invest 100% of your income because all of your expenses are covered by your invested income. And the easiest way to get there is to create capital events. And a capital event is where you get a big chunk of money in one go that you can deploy into income generating uh, assets. Now, Typically, that's real estate or business. Typically, the, the capital event is going to come from selling a property or selling uh, a business. Now, to do real estate flipping, you have to have some capital in the first place. You have to be able to put a deposit down or buy a piece of real estate to then flip it and create that kind of capital event. Whereas I kind of found out that in business, you can enter into a business transaction with no money down a lot more easily than you can in a real estate transaction, but still create a capital event at the other end. And often what you'll find is whilst you can take an income out of a business, it's a volatile income stream. It's, a, it's an operationally generated income stream. And so we try and turn those income streams into capital as quickly as we can, and then deploy that capital into kind of truly passive investments rather than investments that might sound passive, but turn out to be quite active. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Are there any examples, perhaps even one of your early deals where, you know, the kind of light bulb moment for you when you realized that you'd done this and you could easily replicate this? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's really interesting is we see this again and again and again in my, in my community. And I thought this was just luck from my perspective. But what happened is I kind of got onto the idea that I'd like to buy a business. And of course, I knew nothing about it. And I was very young and I looked very young as well. I always um, looked younger than I was, which, which I guess now is a benefit. Then was a handicap. You know, it took me about 18 months, I think, of knocking on doors and speaking to people before I got a deal done. And that was a game changer because I didn't risk any capital and we grew by a year's worth of sales in an afternoon. So it had a, a, a really kind of quick and immediate impact on, uh, on my business. And two weeks later, I bought another one. It was kind of like the cork had popped and now there was no stopping kind of thing. And what's really funny is when I look at the Harbour Club community, exactly the same thing happens. I was speaking to somebody yesterday who's in Australia. They did their first deal um, about two weeks ago and they've just closed their second one. There was a, cat, a chap called Jamie I was talking to who um, took 18 months to do his first deal and did three in 10 days. I think one of the things that holds you back, what, what's that old um, adage? If you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. Um, and as you go into these situations, I reckon there's just an element of you that thinks you can't. And that comes across the table to the other guy. And, and for whatever reason, you can't. And then, you know, once you've done one, that bit disappears from your brain. You now know it's possible. And that opens up, you know, un unleashes you basically on the world um, to become a deal junkie. Now, do you believe anyone can, can learn this, Jeremy? 
Yeah, within reason. I mean, look, um, one of the key things here is you have to be able to build rapport with a business owner. And part of part of the process of building rapport is, is empathy. And some people just can't create an empathetic relationship with another human being. Uh, and by the way, this is not about being, um, you know, um, outgoing or introvert or anything like that. Actually, introverts often make better deal makers because they tend to shut the fuck up and listen to people. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's quite a healthy, helpful uh, quality. Um, but some people are just anti-people and really, really struggle to build relationships in any context. And I would also say, you know, whatever business you're going to buy first, you don't have to understand that business, but it's quite helpful to have a little bit of an understanding of the industry that you're going into. It will help with that rapport and it will help with that credibility. And so if you have zero experience, you've done nothing in the world of business. I mean, it's going to be quite hard to build that trust that you're the safe pair of hands they should give their business to. Now, we've seen ex-military people do this. We've seen people who've had long corporate careers do this very effectively because they have transposable skills that they can bring uh, to the party. So it's not about different experience. It's about no experience. I think if you've got no <laughs> life experience, it's going to be very, very hard to convince somebody they should hand their, their baby over to you. So you've referred to the Harbour Club a couple of times there, Jeremy. So this you set up in 2009. It's now a global community for people who want to learn about mergers and acquisitions. And uh, based on your experiences and obviously now the community who are following in your footsteps of uh, buying, selling and, and fixing businesses, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a community. And, and look, I learn as much from them as they learn from me. I mean, we have these deal fest um, uh, events where we all get together and share case studies. And these are hugely valuable. I, I learn so much from those. Um, plus, I mean, in the intro, you mentioned the 100 companies I bought and sold and the 200 advised deals. I mean, since 2016, we've also been taking companies public and we've taken over 100 companies public. And I would never have taken a company public, I think, if it wasn't for the community and the ideas and the inspiration that comes from um, working within that community and, and leading that community. So, no, it's been hugely valuable. We're, we're an anti-seminar and uh, we're not just there to sell people uh, training. There's no upsells. We don't have these gold, platinum, diamond things that people can sign up to. It's just a straightforward uh, membership with lots of events and lots of learning kind of built into it. There's nothing else like it because there's not really anywhere that you can learn how to deal with owner-managed businesses. Um, if you do an MBA, it will teach you how the largest brewer in the world bought the second largest brewer in the world. If you if you go to lawyers and accountants, they just want to sell you legal services and accounting services. If you go to brokers, they'll just say you have to use a broker. So there's, there's not really any unbiased information out there as to how you can get these deals done sensibly. I definitely want to hear more about it. And I know you've kind of got eight steps, uh, wealth being the final uh, step. So we'll find out kind of what leads up to that. But um, one of the things that we hear very often, Jeremy, I'd like to ask you this. When it comes to people building wealth, things that hold them back, things that stop them taking that first step. Firstly, well, I haven't got any money to get started. So we're, we're going to address that one. The other one is time. Now, you've just talked about all of the things that you're involved in taking over 100 companies public. Someone might say, well, you know, how do you hit the time? How do you manage your time, Jeremy? Running businesses is incredibly time consuming. And that's why I don't run businesses. That's why I buy them and sell them. When you buy them and sell them, you're a shareholder. And shareholding is a passive activity. So the, the goal for me is to be the passive investor rather than the active operator. And this was a huge learning curve because when I was running my telecoms company, I believed I could do everything better than everybody else. You would um, be slow to delegate. You would um, buy companies and then tell people what to do. You would buy companies and immediately implement 100 things that you wanted to change. And what I realized after several years of doing it is although I was really, really busy, I wasn't really adding any extra value. I overvalued my own impact on these businesses. And when I didn't do all of that stuff, they did just fine. And that was a, that was a big dawning realization. It was a really, it was a really good um, ego check um, in terms of how much value you can bring. And actually, you know, I have a, a pretty narrow band of expertise. I'm really good at getting the deals done. And if I just focus on that, that's my highest value activity. And that activity is actually kind of feast or famine. So um, I have a young family, but we travel a lot. We travel every month somewhere. And it's normally once with the kids and then once, uh, you know, mummy and daddy time somewhere. Um, and so uh, every month we're going away somewhere. The summer, we take pretty much the whole summer off. We'll leave on the 29th of June and come back in September. So, you know, we, we make the most of the, uh, of the time outside. But you can also guarantee that a deal will close while I'm, you know, in 
up in the mountains in in Italy or something like that in the in the summer, um, and that's fine because it will be you know a few hours of my time dedicated to that particular thing, perhaps a couple of Zoom calls and some frantic uh, calls from lawyers. Um, but then it's done. It's feast or famine. You're either super busy or you don't have that much um, to do. So. Um, I much prefer that way of working. I think many people do startups because they're looking for freedom. They want financial freedom and they want time freedom. And then they do a startup and it takes away all of their money and all of their time. And they can't even take a take a vacation or a holiday um, from the business. And, and I see that a lot. Um, in fact, quite often the businesses that we're buying, the average age of a company that we buy, by the way, is about 23 years old. So these are well-established um, businesses. But I see businesses that we're buying where they've not taken a holiday since they started it. So you've got somebody that's been in a business for two decades without having a proper holiday. And sometimes that's one of the motivational factors to doing the deal is I want to go on holiday. <laughs> so I just want to go and spend time with the kids or go and go and do something, which is, you know, a- alien to me because since I started, since I sold my telecoms company, which is in 2006, and I just bought and sold companies, I've spent every day that I can with, with my kids and I'm able to spend a lot of time at home and work from home most of the time. And so, um, yeah, it gives you a, a, a massive lifestyle uh, enhancement. Yeah, and, and we talk a lot about recurring income, Jeremy, but people commonly refer to that as passive income. And I know that's a term you're not so in favour of. Well, it's just been bastardised and hijacked by every charlatan on the planet, hasn't it, <laughs> for selling their dreams and schemes. Um, so, you know, you see these, uh, you know, trading bots that automatically spit out money or you see these, you know, uh, FX programs that automatically spit out money or you see these, um, you know, real estate uh, um, uh, projects that uh, are supposed to be passive. And, you know, in my experience, you know, a lot of these things aren't passive at all. They're actually quite active. I mean, you know, for example, I sold all of our um, real estate that we don't live in and went into REITs instead. Um, because, you know, we were spending every summer screwing door handles back on and getting boilers fixed in, in apartments in, in different places. And, you know, you just look at, you, you look at yourself doing this and you think, shit, you know, uh, I'm doing $10 an hour jobs when I could be doing $1,000 an hour, uh, jobs or even better doing nothing. <laughs> um, and, uh, whilst it was really exciting at the time, you know, it's a rite of passage, I think, but it's something that you have to grow out of. And so, you know, I very much now look at um, physical real estate as a business, not as a not as a uh, an investment. So, if you want a physical real estate business, that's fine, have one. Um, but recognize it's a business, not you know, it has customers, it has challenges that you have to deal with on on a regular basis. Whereas a REIT is a passive investment, you know, and I'm sure your listeners are aware it's a real estate investment trust, but it's effectively it's a publicly listed, managed portfolio of real estate. Um, and it, uh, the, the other thing I like is it enables you very quick and easy geographic uh, distribution. So I can invest in, you know, Sydney, Singapore, New York, uh, London, Paris um, uh, with $1,000 in each um, or $10,000 in each or whatever you want. And then I can also go into sectors that I perhaps couldn't as a private investor, like I can be a shareholder in a hospital or I can be a shareholder in a hotel or in um you know, industrial units or um, storage facilities or, you know, any number of these um, classes of real estate that generate pretty good yields, have pretty good capital appreciation. um, And with a REIT, you you have it professionally managed and and have this income stream, which actually in the current environment, the income stream from a REIT is probably slightly better than direct investment because leverage now has got expensive and uh, rental margins have got squeezed. So, um, you know, you might be able to get 3% on a flat in London. You probably get 7 or 8% on a, on a London re- uh, residential REIT. So let's come back to how someone might learn to buy and sell businesses for a living. And in particular, someone who's listening now thinking, how do you buy a business without using any cash up front? So how do you go about this? When I started this, um, you know, my, I, I believe there were only three ways to grow my business. And that was sales, marketing and the team that I had working for me. And I then had loads of people coming to try and buy my business from me. The reason I didn't think about buying a company was exactly that. I didn't have any money and the banks wouldn't lend me any money. Then I had all these people coming to try and buy my business. And I realized they also didn't have any money. <laughs> and they also didn't have banks that would lend them money. What they had was a really compelling story and a solution to um, challenges that I was facing uh, in my business. And so I basically figured, well, 
I could be on the other side of this table. I can use that same pitch and go and approach people myself. And, you know, and, and over the years, it's kind of perfected and perfected. But there's basically a couple of um, really simple ones that I could explain for your audience now, um, which would be relatively easy for them to, to, to grasp. And the first one is leveraging the business owner instead of the business. So you may have heard of a leverage buyout. Well, a leverage buyout is where you borrow money from the bank to go and buy a business. And it's a terrible idea. Lots of people, you know, when they think of no money down deals, think of leverage buyouts because it's similar to what happens in real estate. You put some money in yourself, you get some money from the bank and bingo, you own a house that you can now rent out. Well, the problem with business is there's a million moving parts and effectively business is more like a highly volatile asset. So imagine a business is less like a property and more like a crypto meme coin. Now, on that basis, would you mortgage your house and stick all of the money into a crypto meme coin? Um, I'm sure somebody in your audience would say yes, but the right answer is no. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't borrow money with a fixed return and invest it in volatile assets. It's a really dumb idea. Well, small business is a volatile asset. If you lose two key staff members or two key customers, that business can disappear overnight and you still owe all of the money that you borrowed for buying it. And so because of that, you have to look at something called the risk-weighted return on capital. And the risk-weighted return on capital is how much you can sensibly pay for something that's risky. And the best way to look at this is you look at the two-year treasury, which is the US uh, um, you know, debt, the US treasury, um, and that's your risk-free rate um, because the US treasury can never fail. Um, they just print more money and it will always meet its obligations. So it's, a, it's called the risk-free return. So the risk-free return on a two-year treasury at the time of recording is about 4.8%. So if you look at how much cash you can take out of a business on an annual basis and multiply that by 20%, that would be valuing it at the same basis as the risk-free return. Now, what's interesting is when you speak to most business owners, that's pretty much exactly what they're doing. They might have a profit of 100 grand. They can take 50 a year out in cash, and they're asking for a million quid for it, which is exactly 20 times and is exactly the same as the risk-free rate. Anyone that gave them that money is a psychopath. Um, they should buy the two-year treasury and just go to sleep at night instead of buying this crappy little um, business. So the first thing is to understand you know, what it is that you're trying to buy it. And then explain to the business owner that in order for them to get anywhere near the, the kind of return that they're looking for, for their business, they're going to have to shoulder some of the risk with you. And they're effectively going to have to be the bank. In other words, you're going to have to defer a large chunk, if not all of the money that they're going to receive over a period of time and work with them collaboratively to extract that value from the business. Otherwise, there are simply better investments out there that would, uh, that would take the capital that they're asking you to give them. Now, for a newbie, that's quite a hard conversation. For a more, a more seasoned deal maker, they can pull that deal off. So we have a strategy that we call WIBO, which is perfect for a newbie, perfect for somebody that's perhaps in a job at the moment or um, just starting out in the area of M&A. And that is, instead of going to them and saying, I'm going to buy your 20-year-old company on a 100% deferred basis over the next five years, which, like I say, is a harder sell to get people past. You simply go in and take a minority stake in the business in exchange for creating a load of value and making the business more sellable. So we have a report that we run the company through, and it shows uh, the current valuation and all the areas of improvement that could be done to make it more sellable and more valuable. We then go in and execute some of those um, plans, which often you know, can double or even triple the profits of the company, improve the balance sheet of the company, but also give it things like a data room and a process manual and things like that. that the next buyer is going to need if they're going to buy it. But at this point, you're a 20% shareholder and you've created a load of value for them. And by the way, you can get paid for this. We sometimes call it consulting for equity. So you do a consulting uh, project with them that you're being paid every month and you get an equity kicker for the success that you create. So you normally pick one of the measurements that you know you're going to hit out of the park and use that as the trigger for the equity component. And then um, maybe six months later, when you've done all of that stuff, um, you're now a 20% shareholder. They're an 80% shareholder. You then put in an offer to buy the remaining 80%, but on a deferred basis paid over time. Now, at that point, they're a lot more receptive to that um, 100% deferred pitch because you've delivered on something you said you were going to do. You've enhanced the value slightly so that the, the value that they're now going to receive is, is better than it was when you first uh, met them. You've done all your due diligence because you've been in the business for six months and been paid uh, while, while you've done stuff. 
and you basically, uh, yeah, warmed up the relationship to the point where you're the safest pair of hands. In fact, what works quite nicely is once you finish that work is to actually put it for sale. So advertise it on businessesforsale.com or bizbuysell.com, one of those venues, and deal with some of the inbound inquiries. And what they'll quickly realize is that most people are chancers and looking to pick the business up for, for nothing. Um, and at that point, they'll say, okay, well, you're a safe pair of hands and you're going to buy it out on this basis. I'd rather give it to you than give it to them. Because there aren't a big queue of people running around with checkbooks to buy these micro businesses. You know, anything below sort of five million in, in revenue is is almost unsellable. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, there's a huge amount of opportunity to pick businesses up in in that fashion. Yeah, because uh, statistically, and just picking up on that point, um, it, not that many businesses sell, right? About eight percent, they reckon. Yeah, eight percent go up for sale actually sell. So when you're a seller, it's important to be you know, head and shoulders above the competition to be sold. But when you go and see these businesses, they're not head and shoulders above the competition. They've still got personal expenses running through the accounts. They haven't documented how they run their business. So it's almost impossible to transition to a new owner. They haven't got a data room where you can find out all the information that you'd need to find out. All they've got is a big shiny price tag that says they want a million quid for it. (laughs) So, um, And almost no justification as to why on earth you would do that. One of the things we do is we do publish tons of free content. So if anybody follows follows me or the Harbour Club, um, we give you tons and tons of free information on how to do this stuff because we're not just trying to sell people membership. We're trying to get more entrepreneurs to be deal makers and, and to make more money from uh, doing deals because because I think it's the next rung on the entrepreneurial ladder. So this is stuff you can get for free. You don't have to join anything or pay anything to, to understand this stuff. We, we publish tons of content around this. Yeah, and just remind people where they're the best place to go and find that is. Yeah, I think probably um, start by following me on on like Instagram or X, um, so Jeremy dot Harbour, um, and uh, and yeah, we we post links to all sorts of different videos and uh, uh, and stuff on there. So yeah, you'll find tons of information. Just before we wrap things up, Jeremy, and I've really enjoyed speaking with you today. We talked at the beginning about, you know, diversification. There are multiple asset classes. We're talking about business today, but are you diversifying now some of those business profits into other asset classes? And if so, why? Yeah, so this is this is kind of the point I alluded to at the beginning. Um, I, I think holding businesses as an asset class is actually not a great idea. I think, um, you know, business can change on a on a dime. So, you know, Google could do it for free or Amazon could come into your um, space or AI could replace uh, what you do or somebody important could die or a customer could go bankrupt. You know, there are so many things that can dramatically change the landscape in your business that my goal is always to de-risk, create the capital event and go and deploy that capital. You know, in much the same way I spoke about the you know the risk-free return being the kind of competition uh, on an on an acquisition, it's kind of the same on an exit. If you can take you know half a million to a million off the table, you can probably get a hundred, two hundred grand a year of income from that, um, which is more than you'd probably be able to take out of the business. And you'd be able to do that on a passive basis rather than um, yeah having an active basis. What kind of example there would you be referring to? Yeah, so I mean, my favorite equity strategy is uh, fixed coupon notes. So fixed coupon notes when markets are a little bit volatile. Um, it's very easy to get 20 to 30% returns. Now, I know that um, most retail customers aren't allowed to buy these much safer, much better structured products. They have to buy stupid high-risk stuff that their financial advisors are allowed to sell them. We also have um, uh, private credit um, uh, type investments that generate 15 to 20% uh, uh, a year. We have our own one called IPIN, I-P-I-N, which is a regulated fund out of uh, Singapore that pays 15%. One of the things I always recommend in the Harbour Club community is you need to get yourself into the private wealth banking space as quickly as possible. And the, I mean, the offshore private banking space, so not like Coots or something like that. You need to be with, you know, Julius Baer, Switzerland or Singapore or UBS or JP Morgan or one of these guys, because there you get, you know, Lombard lending at uh, less than a percent per year uh, above base. Uh, my, my rate's about 0.7% at the moment. And um you also get access to the institutional version of all of the funds. So things like PIMCO and Schroders and all of those funds, which don't really make sense for retail investors because the cost is too high. They have an institutional version where the cost is really, really low, um, which is what they sell to the Harvard Alumni Fund and the, and the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Well, as a private banking client, you can get those, um, which pay a much, much higher return because they don't have the drag 
of the expenses that the retail version has. Um, you can also buy direct bonds. So through a private bank, I can buy an Apple bond or a Microsoft bond um, and hold it until maturity. Um, as a retail client, you have to buy a bond fund, which is volatile according to interest rates. Um, and so you have a, a potential for capital loss. Whereas if you're wealthy and you buy a direct bond, your capital is protected because you receive all of the capital back at the expiration of the bond. So the first thing to break out of the rat race, if you like, is to get onto, pri onto the private banking ladder. Because once you're on the private banking ladder, it just opens up a sea of opportunities. And that Lombard lending one is, is huge because um, against your portfolio at any time, if you have a big capital expense, like you want to buy a new house or you want to buy a car, you can simply just take the money straight out of the bank within an hour um, at 0.7% per year. Um, I gave an example. We went to... Uh, we were traveling for four months over the summer um, a few years ago, and we bought a Maserati Levante um, because all the taxis in this country were terrible. We bought a Maserati Levante uh, when we when we arrived, and we sold it when we left. And the cost of that car for that whole period of time, you know, brand new or six months old, um, was one hundred and eighty dollars. Uh, and also uh, another one, I bought a yacht. I've got, I've had several yachts. I've got uh, a, a, another, a different one at the moment, but the one I had at the time, I was living in, uh, or I had a house in Mallorca in Spain. And I had a, a yacht there. And basically, I was just pissing around on websites, offering people half what they were asking for their yachts. And one of them went and said yes, didn't they? <laughs> so, um, and I think it was advertised for like 550 and I got it for 220 or something like this. Um, and so you have to buy it. You can't say no. Um, I used a Lombard loan for it. And my cost of capital was two grand a year. So I had a half a million dollar yacht for two grand a year. You know, those kind of things. I mean, it's why Jeff Bezos never never pays any tax and why he has a half a billion dollar yacht and, and didn't pay tax on that half a billion dollars because he simply lombards against his Amazon stock and then slowly deleverages by selling some of the stock to um, pay down uh, the loans. Um, same with Elon Musk, same with lots of, uh, lots of wealthy people. The rules of the rich, hey? <laughs> Yeah, so join them. Don't, yeah, if you can't beat them, join them. It's uh, yeah, you're only a few, you're only a few capital events away. And like I say, the, the the easiest way I can see to creating those capital events is buy a business for no money down and sell it for six to seven figures, and rinse and repeat. Yeah, no, it's been really fascinating speaking with you today, Jeremy. I can see you at home. You've got your family there with you. So, final question: You know, is there a legacy that you wish to be remembered for? Oh God, uh, I haven't thought that that far in advance. Like I say, I'm I'm uh, uh, yeah a bit of a deal junkie. So I'm, you know, when people ask me what my favourite deal is, it's always the next one. And uh, and yeah, I'm in my living room at the moment because there are builders upstairs refurbishing our whole top floor, and my uh, home office is up there. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm relegated to the uh, to the living area at the moment. Thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us today. I'll let you get back to that Dubai sunshine. Lovely, fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, enjoy the UK sunshine. So clear to see Jeremy is a very entrepreneurial kind of guy there, Kevin, from a young age. He got hooked on buying businesses and uh, no turning back for him, that's for sure. Well, it's great when you know yourself, and Jeremy clearly does. He's got an investor's DNA, a deal maker's DNA, and he loves the thrill of the deal. And, and that's so obvious, and I think it's great if you're like that. But it's great to understand the principles, even if you're not. If you're not fundamentally about chasing lots of deals, but you just want to do enough to give you the income that you want, then you can you can achieve the same result, but without the same obvious drive that he has. So plenty of lessons for us to dive into. Before we do that, let's head on over to our latest review on Trustpilot this week. And thanks go to Vicky for taking time to uh, write the following. And she says... I've loved dealing with the Wealth Builders team and in recent years have gained a lot of benefits from the Academy program. The important thing for me is that the key people in Wealth Builders have an ethical approach to creating financial security. I was initially wary, having seen upselling galore in the past by other organizations. It became clear to me that's not how Kevin and Christian operate. There's a lot of great content, support and connections available here. A special thanks to Helen and John, my coach, Overall, highly recommended. Oh, that's nice to see that many of our team are getting a mention and uh, thankful as we are to our team, but just as thankful to our members and to those people who take a moment or two to let people know their experiences. And I think we're always pleased when the same words keep come time and time and time again, don't they really, Chris? 
They do indeed, yeah. So let's let's talk about business now. And uh, I pulled out a few stats uh, from online, Kevin, just to give some context around, you know, well, how big is the market? How big? How many opportunities are there out there to be buying businesses? And at the start of 2023, there were 5.6 million small businesses in the UK. And surprisingly, um, more than half, 50, 56% of those uh, are sole proprietors. And uh, less than 5% of companies have been around for 20 years or more. Uh, and 80% of businesses brought to a sale don't sell, though you might argue perhaps more than that. Well, you've given me death by statistics, Chris. <laughs> I was beginning to fall asleep there. <laughs> we need some statistics to back things up. Of course we do. And 5 million or thereabouts is the number that I would normally raise when talking about uh, the number of businesses in the UK. And I think Jeremy calls them owner-managed businesses. And they don't necessarily have to be limited companies because the business is a business. The tax structure can be different. But the staggering fact for me, and I've repeated this before, Chris, on other podcasts, that from the national statistics of businesses that are sold, where there's a capital gains tax bill, because all businesses that sell uh, using what was called entrepreneur's relief get a capital gains dispensation up to £1 million. Now, not that many businesses are sold for £1 million, less than 1%. In fact, staggeringly less than 1%. It's only 5,000 businesses a year. There's 0.1%, which means Jeremy's spot on. You know, the vast majority of owner-managed businesses are not sold. And they're not sold because either they can't be sold, there's a mismatch in understanding between the buying price and the selling price. It's not like a house or a car or a bit of jewellery you can put a value on. Most people put their life's work into a business and, often want more money than actually somebody's willing to pay for. And in truth, an acquirer is looking for future profit and predictable future profit, which is where we've spoken in the past about the importance of recurring income. But most businesses do not have recurring income. And many business owners actually leave it too late. And when they come to think about selling, we know the average age of a business that's sold through normal channels is 57. So let's say most people are older when they don't sell. Um, and then the business is either going to be dropped or it's going to be scrapped, if you remember that from previous episodes. You can do a great service for continuing employment, continuing service delivery, you know, serving a community of people who want a product or a service uh, by finding and identifying that cohort of biz own, biz, business owners who want something for the business, but they, do, they definitely don't want it to scrap. You know, they, if it's a school, they value the fact the school is providing service. You know, normally it's a service. It's a, a continuation of service or a continuation of employment or a continuation of a culture that respects and appreciates somebody in the chain. And I think if you can recognize that, understand that, appreciate that deeply, then you can find a win-win solution to help a business owner gain some value rather than no value. And you can gain value too. And you don't necessarily have to add an incredible amount of value. It's always good if you can, if you've got some skill. But if you can acquire a business where the acquisition just means really taking over the delivery and if you can work out how to do that through understanding some core skills that are required for a business to operate, because you're not looking for another job, are you? So you're looking for a business that can run. And we've got lots of skills. We teach people about how what are the key principles of a business that works without you. And if you can find that, recurring income being number one, number two, being outstanding in a niche, and number three, the business being capable of being systemized. You know, so if you can create some core principles and look for businesses that match those principles, then you can find business owners. They're not difficult to locate. I mean, they advertise for goodness sake. So, you know, somewhere, you know, they're, they're findable. And um, if you can do a good job of finding and you don't need the funding in the same way as you do when you're buying property, for example, where you need deposits or you need refurbishment costs and so on, I think it's a very clever thing to be able to find a good and ethical solution, not to take advantage of business owners to help all parts of that triangle 
you know, the suppliers and well, those who are benefiting from it, suppliers, let's say, employees and, and, and customers being one end, the business owners themselves who want to get some value and uh, those people who are buying the businesses. And if you look at the baby boomers who are increasingly the, you know, that millions of them coming to retire every year, it's easy to identify the boomers and try and help them secure their retirement by giving them something from the income or the future income of the business. Because every business that's ever sold is built on some kind of multiple of the future income because that's where the money comes from. But why would you buy a business if there wasn't predictable future income? Well, you wouldn't buy it. So it's the same principle. Future income, once predictable, can be paid to the owner of the business or the current owner of the business, or some of it can be paid in installments. So just like getting an annuity from your pension, there are just different ways where you can secure um, an, an outcome, you can secure a transaction without having to physically pay for it with a single lump sum that you'd have to find. So very clever, very intelligent. Obviously, the, the more experience you get at this, and at the beginning it can sound daunting, but Jeremy teaches this. And for those people who are interested in that, I would uh, gravitate towards, you know, his website, which is obviously available. And, and you know, others do the same thing too. But uh, Jeremy was certainly able to demonstrate the value that he brings, not just for himself, but the people who join the Harbour Club. Absolutely. And uh, with all our, you know, fantastic guests, uh, we love to work collaboratively with them. And Jeremy is someone that uh, for our members, there'll be additional benefits inside of our Wealth Hub. And uh, we haven't talked too much, but we've recently launched the Wealth Hub, Kevin. I think we should probably do an episode very, very soon to let everybody know exactly what that's all about. Well, yeah, it's just Kev's big black book, isn't it? It's no longer a little black book. I'm it's getting out online. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting posted online so that our members can physically see who those people are that we resonate with the most and who, at least to the best of our knowledge, do a great job. And, of course, it's the feedback of our members that will continue to validate that. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to to sharing the podcast on that specifically, Chris. Good. So thank you, Kevin, for your thoughts. And uh, thank you once again to Jeremy for sharing uh, some of the insights into how you can buy businesses for, uh, you know, no money down or certainly very little cash up front. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you think somebody else might like to take a listen, please hit your share button right now on your podcasting app. We're now at... 250 plus episodes so there's plenty of back catalog for uh, people to go back and enjoy and uh, we often speak to uh, people every day kevin and uh, they say they've just discovered wealth talk and they're going back to episode one and they're binging all the way from the beginning and, and we love to hear that and we really really hope you've enjoyed all the episodes so far and uh, we'll hopefully get another 250 in us kevin <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure about that but um, <laughs> i was talking to somebody today who said she was she downloaded a copy of the seven pillars of wealth and listened to it at the same time you know it's almost oh, reading yeah. along yeah so everybody likes to consume information and in, in different ways whether you're allowed to read listen whether you engage with your ears you know whatever senses that m most resonate with you and your learning style we do our best to make that available to you so uh, however you you like to consume our content uh, please do that. It helps you get to know us and uh, us get to know you. If you're one of those people who give us feedback, what would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? Can you post a review to let other people know that we're hitting the sweet spot when it comes to good content and good sharing? So we're sharing. Why don't you? All right. Thanks for listening. Take care. Kevin, we'll catch up same time, same place next week. We will indeed. And until then, my friend, see ya. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget that we are constantly updating our resources inside the Wealth Builders membership site to help you create, build and protect your wealth. Head over to wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership right now for free access. That's wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership.